What's going on everyone? Charlie here. I'm going to attempt to tell this story again. It's the story of Wall Street and the Federal Reserve and it basically begins in 1987 or the worst day that the Dow had ever seen at the time and it happened in 1987. It, you may remember it as the flash crash. I want to connect whatever happened that day to whatever's going on right now and I'm going to show you in this part one just how many players were involved in that scandal and are still in the game today. Let's go ahead and take a look. This is part one, and I'm gonna to try to connect this all together for you because it's very, very connected. Let's take a look. So Monday, October 19th, 1987. Black Monday. On October 19, 1987, the Dow Jones dropped 508 points, or almost 22% in a single day. That was Black Monday. At that point, Black Monday represented the Dow's biggest single day drop. Before the month ended, however, most major exchanges had fallen by more than 20%. The sell-off began in markets in the Far East and then moved across Europe until it reached the United States. As prices deteriorated, panic ensued, making matters worse. No single event triggered the crash. Yeah, that's what they want you to think, but I think there was one single event and it was the crash itself, 1987. Whatever triggered it was the bond rigging going on by Salomon Brothers, who we're gonna look at next. Part one, the rise and fall of Salomon Brothers and the alumni that exist today. Salomon Brothers was American was an American multinational bulge bracket investment bank headquartered in New York. It was one of the five largest investment banking enterprises in the United States at the time and the most profitable firm on Wall Street during the 1980s and 1990s. Well, where do we know about profit and Wall Street? Crime. Its CEO and chairman at the time, John Gitfreund or Gutfreund, was nicknamed the King of Wall Street. So he was one of the most popular traders at the time, King of Wall Street. Great nickname to have in a crime ring. Salomon Brothers was the citadel of its time, and amongst its alumni we have the following people who are still relevant in today's crisis, which in my opinion is the same crisis that started in 1987. They've just been doing a damn good job at covering everything up. Let's go ahead and take a look. First, we have Michael Lewis. Then, Michael Lewis worked as a bond salesman in London for Salomon Brothers in the late 1980s. Lewis quit his job at Salomon to write Liar's Poker. He also wrote the popular movie, The Big Short. Now, writing bestsellers year by year, um, he's an author now. In the financial sphere, he's received praise for The Big Short and Bloomberg, or I'm sorry, and Boomerang about the after effects of the financial crisis. In the cinematic world, two of his books, The Blind Side and Moneyball, have been made into critically acclaimed films. He's the least of our worries. Then we have Michael Stockman. Michael Stockman has worked since 1985 at Premier Investment Banks and Financial Services Boutiques. He spent his first 10 years trading and building businesses in the mortgage and asset-backed markets at Salomon Brothers, Goldman Sachs, and Morgan Stanley, and spent the next 12 years from 1995 to 2007 as a risk management and fixed income professional acquiring broad and deep product and capital markets expertise at UBS Investment Bank. Now he's a partner at WMD Capital Partners LLC and Senior Vice President at WMD Asset Management LLC. Next we have John Merriweather. John Merriweather was the head of fixed income trading at Salomon and rose to vice chairman in 1988. He resigned from the firm when it became embroiled in a scandal involving false bids for treasury bonds. Now, he started his own hedge fund, you may have heard of it, the Long Term Capital Management, which had a spectacular fall in 1998 after a bad bet on the Russian ruble and, and losing 90% of their assets. After that, Merriweather started JWM Partners, which also closed following the 2008 financial crisis. Next, we have Michael Bloomberg, very relevant today. Then Michael Bloomberg was head of equity trading and systems development at Salomon in the 1970s. He was fired in the early 1980s and left with a $10 million severance package. How he got here? He used his severance pay from Salomon to start Innovative Market Systems, which later became Bloomberg LP. Today, you may have heard of the Bloomberg Terminal. They are now ubiquitous site at every financial firm and the company's news service is now the largest media outlet in the world. Bloomberg himself left the company in 2001 to become mayor of New York City, but he's still a majority owner of the firm. 
His first primary was held on September 11, 2001. John Merriweather. John Merriweather spent 14 years as a managing director, overseeing fixed income sales of Salomon and later Citigroup when it was acquired in 1999. After leaving Salomon Brothers in 2000, he has worked with UBS Investment Bank, BTIG Investment Group, MF Global, BNP Paribas, and today currently works with Jeffries Group, GameStop's underwriter in 2021 for their share offerings. Next, we have Louis Ranieri. Ranieri headed the mortgage bonds desk at Salomon and was considered by many to be the father of the mortgage-backed security. He left Salomon in 1987 after, you guessed it, the scandal. Now, recently partnered with Shell Point Partners to offer subprime mortgage lending, um, saying it's an untapped market. Also, still coming under criticisms for being the brains behind the mortgage bonds that contributed to the financial crisis of 2008. Thanks, Lewis. Next, we have Myron Scholes. Joined Salomon in 1990 as a special consultant, then rose to managing director of fixed income derivatives. Scholes partnered with Merriweather to start long-term capital management. Before the fund collapsed, Scholes won a Nobel Prize in economics with Robert Merton for his pioneering work in derivatives valuation, the Black Scholes model, something that the group I'm in should be very familiar with when we use it for trading. Now, Scholes is currently the chairman of the board of economic advisors of Stamos Capital Partners. Next, we have Warren Buffett. In 1987, you know, the scandal year, Berkshire Hathaway purchased a 12% stake in Salomon, making it the largest shareholder and Buffett a director. In 1990, a scandal involving John Goodfriend, former CEO of Salomon, Salomon Brothers, surfaced. A rogue trader, Paul Moser, was submitting bids in excess of what was allowed by Treasury rules. When this was brought to Gutfreund's attention, he did not immediately suspend the rogue trader. The CEO left the company in August 1991. Buffett became the chairman of Solomon until the crisis had passed. Now, of course, Warren Buffett is the chairman and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway. Robert Gensler. Rob was employed by Salomon Brothers and worked for five years as a vice president in their equity division as an analyst in their equity risk arbitrage department. He later went on to become the vice president of T. Rowe. Now, Robert Gensler retired from T. Rowe in 2012, but still holds a board position with the company. His twin brother, Gary Gensler, is also Securities and Exchange Commission chairman as of April 27, 2021. That should say April 17th. That's not correct. April 17th, 2021. Sworn in on a Saturday. Having fun yet? Stephen Bellowardo. Then, Stephen was the vice president of Salomon Brothers from 1992 until February of 1996. After Salomon, he went on to Morgan Stanley, Deutsche Bank, and in 2002, went on to Citadel Securities, where he worked as the managing director and head of front office technology. Now, Stephen is currently now on a, on a family leave of absence due to COVID, and he still works at Citadel, where he is currently the Senior Managing Director, or Head of Core Engineering, a position which he took in April of 2020, that's right, when the Supplemental Leverage Ratio started for COVID. Next, we have Tom Miglis, who is, at that time, the Managing Director of Salomon in the 1990s. He was their technology developer. He would go on to work with Citadel's very own Ken Griffin to help implement the the technology that dominates the markets today in 2021. He is now a board advisor at NYCA Partners. Isn't this crazy shit? He is a key player in why Citadel is as big as they are today. Now, last but certainly not least. Thank you, Mr. Mullins. Um, the third, third panelist today is the Honorable Jerome Powell, Assistant Secretary for Domestic uh, Finance uh, with the Department of the Treasury. Mr. Powell, are you prepared? Yes, I am. You can commence. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ronaldo. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to discuss the oversight and regulation of the government securities market in light of Solomon Brothers' recently admitted violations of auction rules and that firm's possible violations of securities laws, antitrust laws, general fraud statutes, SEC regulations, and New York Stock Exchange rules. A written testimony, which I submit for the record, discusses in detail Treasury auctions, including the role of primary dealers and significant auction rules, a chronology of developments concerning the February and May auctions, and discussion of regulatory issues. That's right, Jerome Powell, the current chair of the Federal Reserve System, 
was the one that led the investigation into the Treasury scandal of the 1980s. And look what's going on with the Treasury today. Do you think it's by some coincidence that we're all still arounding the Treasury? I don't. And in part two, I'm going to show you how we got here. By the way, the fine for these crimes, $100,000. Go get them, Jerome. Salomon Brothers, to be continued.